Hey everybody! Last time we were talking about Hoover's, um, some would say failed presidency in terms of his ability to deal with the Great Depression. And today we're going to start looking at uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And um, the voters spoke in 1920, 1932, I'm sorry. In 1932 they overwhelmingly elected Franklin Delano Roosevelt over Herbert Hoover. Um, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt promised them uh, a new plan to deal with the, the Depression and a, a departure from the ways of Hoover and limited government. This um, lecture goes with two pieces of paper. It actually goes with this, Introduction to Franklin D. Roosevelt, um, and then this. We're going to be talking about his New Deal programs. And so these two, in fact, yours might actually be nicer than this. Yours might actually have some writing in it to uh, make this go a little faster. So, okay, um, so let's go right to the video and see what we have going on here. Um, this is a cartoon of Franklin Delano Roosevelt that we'll be analyzing in class. Um, and it speaks to kind of his perception, the perception of him during this time period. So, the first thing you need to know about FDR is how different he was from uh, Herbert Hoover in terms of his whole, like, personality. He was extremely charismatic and optimistic, and he um, just seemed to uh, inspire people with a lot of confidence and hope. Um, he seemed like a jolly fellow, a happy warrior um, sort of guy that uh, they thought was a lot better than Hoover's seemingly dour um, speeches and, and presence. Um, it was his most famous quote was in his first inaugural address where he said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. At some point he tried to convince people that this was kind of all in our heads and we could change our minds and change the world if we uh, just kind of reframed the situation. So that was a powerful statement. And um, some obvious comparisons have been made between uh, FDR and President Obama as President Obama inherited a, a very bad economy as well. So this is a little bit of a Time Magazine put out this uh, this cover uh, when Obama was um, inaugurated as well. His management style was one where he was just a great manager. He didn't necessarily have to know everything. So what he did is he just sought the advice. He was really a C student at the best. Actually, he was not a good student at all growing up. So he just gathered the smartest people in the room and sought their advice. This was called the Brain Trust, where he got the Ivy League professors um, and economists from all over the country and he got them together in a room and had them brainstorm what their best ideas were about how to solve the Great Depression. The other thing that was key about FDR is he was willing to experiment. He was not committed to a single philosophy or idea about government. Instead, he was just willing to try stuff. And if that didn't work, he was going to try something else. Um, but that was another great asset he brought to the presidency because these were times unlike any others that we'd faced before. So it was really a time to try and do some experimenting to find the right solutions. We'll analyze this cartoon in class. It's a classic from the time period. Um, his program, he gave it a name, much like Teddy Roosevelt, his distant cousin, had named his program the Square Deal. FDR called his the New Deal. And he was aided by a Democratic Congress, and so this was a very, very productive um, uh, first term for the president because many programs and agencies were created in his first 100 days to help the Great Depression. And all presidents since then have been held to this 100-day standard where the media kind of checks in on day 100 to see what the president has accomplished. Because the idea is that the president comes into his first term with a certain degree of political capital, and he should capitalize on that quickly and get, this, get some things done, get a lot of things done in the first 100 days. He should kind of strike while the fire is hot, and um, that's certainly what uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt did. Um, he also created all these agencies, and they had alphabet names given to them to shorten him up because a lot of them were quite lengthy. So you can see that on your chart. Um, so the National Recovery Administration was called the NRA, not to be confused with today's National Rifle Association. So some of these alphabet agencies can be a little confusing. For example, another one is the AAA, which is not the American Auto Association. It's the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. So um, those alphabet agencies um, all stand for certain names of programs. The other thing that Franklin Delano Roosevelt did is he connected to the people by using brand new technologies like the radio. We know that in the 1920s, a lot of American households gained the radio. So what FDR did is he started giving weekly radio chats explaining what the government was doing and why they were doing it and what the American people needed to do to support the government. And um, we still do this today. Actually, most Americans are not aware of the fact that the president still gives a weekly radio address. Um, I I can't say I've heard a station around here that has ever aired it. <laughs> so maybe it's a podcast now. I'm not exactly sure. but So the first week, for example, he got on the radio and he explained how banks work. This is called the bank holiday. By the way, that's a, just marketing genius. He didn't call it a bank closure. 
or a bank shutdown. He called it a holiday. Like, you kind of feel like the banks didn't, they weren't in trouble, they were just vacationing in the Bahamas for a period of time or something. Um, then he got on the radio and he explained to people how banks work and that they're going to be inspected and he's only, only going to open up banks that are going to be solvent. And that he really needed everyone to go take their money and put it back in the banks, that that was really going to be the solution. And the Monday after that fireside chat, more people put money in the banks than withdrew it. So um, clearly there was some uh, resonance among the American people to what the president was telling them to do. So we're going to go ahead and transition now to the other chart, and we're going to be looking at what the actual agencies were um, that he created. The first one's called the FDIC, the Federal Depositors Insurance Corporation. And it should look familiar to you because um, if you bank at a bank, it should have FDIC somewhere on the signage of the institution. It was established by the Glass-Steagall Banking Act, um, which, among other things, made banks and investing houses divide. So up until recently, when Clinton was president, basically a bank was either a bank or it was a stock brokerage investment firm, but it couldn't be both because they thought that that's what had caused part of the problems with the Great Depression is that banks were investing in the stock market. So it was established by Glass-Steagall Banking Act and it protected each account back then up to $5,000. So if the bank, there's a run on the bank and the bank lost your money, the government would replace your money um, up to $5,000. Today that's been bumped to $250,000. And uh, as you probably know, if you become a millionaire and you have multiple millions of dollars, you should spread the love around and put $250,000 in each bank and bank at several banks. Uh, that way all your money will be accounted for if there's a a problem with the bank. Hope you have that problem one day. Um, it gave uh, bank customers confidence that their money was safe and that if um, they did, if the bank did lose their money due to bad investments or overextension of credit, that the um, the government would come in and kind of save the day and reimburse them for their losses. So, this is what the FDIC seal looks like, um, and you can see that in today's uh, logo, it is still located inside the C there. So. Look for that when you bank to make sure that your money is safe. Next we have the Securities and Exchange Commission. This was all about trying to make sure the stock exchange was fair and wasn't rigged. So um, the stock market, if you recall, before the Great Depression began, uh, they thought there had been a lot of insider trading and those things going on. So uh, one year after the Federal Securities Act um, that started requiring reports of all transactions to be noted, who was selling to who and when. And it also was trying to prevent insider trading um, and try and keep people from rigging the market. I always have students who are a little interested in this, so let me talk for a moment about it. The most famous example of this in recent history has been Martha Stewart. I don't know if you know who she is. She's like a domestic goddess of um, an, an entertainment kind of hostessing empire. She um, has allied herself with Kmart and does sheet sets and blankets and decor and that kind of stuff. But... When she first started her dynasty as kind of a domestic goddess, she um, uh, invested in a pharmaceutical company. And uh, the pharmaceutical company was doing drug trials on anti-cancer drugs. And um, she got an inside tip from someone who was running the lab that the, um, the medicines the pharmaceutical company was developing failed in testing. So the next day, there was going to be an announcement of this fact, and then everyone would know that their stock values were going to go sharply down because the, the products that the company were, were banking on being a success were not a success. So based on this early information she got from an insider, she sold all her stock the day before the announcement. So that would tip off a, um investigation by the Securities and Exchange Commission. They kind of watch for stuff like that, like the day before a big announcement and lots of people's stock values went down, did someone sell the day before that? And they saw that Martha Stewart had. They requisitioned all the emails of her assistant and her and they eventually found out that she actually was insider trading. And so she um, went to jail uh, and served in a federal prison for, I believe, four years for insider trading. So that's an example of how that works. Now, a lot of times my students have questions like, well, if you own stock in your own company and you know what's going on with the company and you sell based on what you know, can you get in trouble? And the way that companies solve that is if you have stock in your own company, they only give you little limited windows of time, three or four times a year, through which you can actually sell your stock. You're not allowed to sell your stock whatever you want. So um, that's the way they control inside the company stockholders from insider trading, okay? So um, yeah, you're not allowed to rig the market. You're supposed to wait until information is made public and then act on that public information, but you can't pump people for inside secret information and sell your stock on that basis, okay? 
Sometimes my students think that sounds a little crazy, but don't kill the messenger, I just report the news. Okay. So they regulate the stock market by exposing corruption and unethical trading practices. And um, what's really funny is they decide to find a guy who has been rigging the market and put him in charge of this, because who better to run an anti-criminal campaign than a criminal? And so they found um, bootlegger uh, Joe Kennedy. Uh, he was from Boston, was part of the Boston Mafia, who had been a bootlegger in Boston. And he wanted to get a legitimate government job because he had sons who he hoped would one day become president. This is John F. Kennedy, his son, who would become president. So this is how the Kennedy clan got a foothold in legitimate positions of power in government. So that's kind of funny when their dad got appointed the head of the SEC. The AAA is the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, and the AAA has a really interesting job. It wants to stop the overproduction of food, because that's the only thing that's going to boost prices, right? So, they paid farmers not to plant. And to farmers, this was quite incredible. They were getting paid to do nothing. This is quite the opposite of what most farmers' experience was like. And they were paid over $200 million for people to plow up crops and slaughter swine and pour extra milk down the drain. And um, all of this was sound economically, but it horrified the American people who had just lived through the World War I clean your plate um, days. It did help raise farm prices and it put money in farmers' pockets. But one negative was that it really upset people because food was being destroyed and they didn't really understand how that could be. So um, this is going to go all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court is going to find that this agency is unconstitutional. And we'll be talking more about that. Okay? So pretty uh, radical approach and one that was not very popular with the people, but very popular with farmers, I might add. Next we have the CCC, it's the Civilian Conservation Corps. It hired young men who were basically graduated from high school and could not find jobs. They ate a lot uh, in their houses and they were a burden on their parents and such. So the idea was to uh, give them uniforms, send them to work for the CCC. They lived in barracks, it was kind of like a domestic army of uh, conservation workers. And they would build roads and build parks and plant trees and um, they would be living there on the bases, provided food and clothing, and they would get a certain amount of money of which um, most of it went home to their families and they kept a little bit of it for themselves, but there really wasn't much for them to spend their money on. They planted over four billion trees. That is billion, not million. I think your, um, I think your uh, handout says something different. I think it says million, so it is billion. And they um, employed three million people. Here's an example of um, the advertising posters that were used to try and get people to be excited about joining the CCC and to become involved. And here's some little examples of trees. Yay, trees. Oh no! <laughs> Let's hope that the CCC was more successful at me at planting trees. Yeah. So, um, key to stopping erosion and the dust storms that um, had uh, uh, been a problem for the plains um, in that time period. Okay, so, yay trees. All right, um, next we have the FERA. The FERA was the, kind of the last ditch agency for people who just needed cash money. Um, they went directly to the states for clothes and food for the poorest people. And the states would match the funds, and um, so the federal government gave $250 million, and the states that were willing to match, they also gave $250 million. It provided some relief, but um, the problem was once you gave people the cash and they spent the cash, they didn't have any um, ability to, um, to get the money the next month either. So it kind of led to this endless cycle of dependence on the government. So they are going to need to come up with some other ways to deal with people who are sick, elderly, unable to work, or um, in areas where it's difficult to create jobs. So, but that was the purpose of the FERA. Then there's two agencies that go together. Your chart just says CWA. You need to add to that PWA. They were the two major job creation programs. Um, the CWA was created because the PWA did not create enough jobs um, at the local level. Um, so you add the CWA which gave local government money to create jobs. So like the mayor of the town would, um, would get some uh, questions about if he had money, if he had jobs he could create at the local level, and if so, the federal government would provide them with the money. It put four million people to work immediately, and they built schools and roads, and so it was a very successful job creation program 
um, on the local and federal level. Here's some examples, and we'll look at these pictures a little more closely in class. Next we had the NIRA, or the NRA, and this was a, um, a, an attempt to try and keep competition between companies at a minimum so that the number of people who were employed could stay employed. Um, I'm going to explain this a little bit better in class. Okay, This one's probably the hardest one to understand, but it basically said that companies were going to not compete against each other so much, and instead they were going to set prices and working conditions um, at a standard that everyone could meet, and so they wouldn't put each other out of business by competing. And this made work hours shorter, and it banned child labor, and union membership went up. It um, overcame kind of a cycle of wage cuts and falling prices and layoffs. And over 500 industries joined the NRA, and small businesses thought that it wasn't really fair because it seemed to give preference to um, large businesses that had economies of scale. So I know I didn't do a great job of explaining the NRA, so I'm going to have to do a better job in class and I can make it real crystal clear how basically this was kind of like a collusion. Government-sponsored trusts were being formed where they did not compete against any mother each other anymore and they set prices kind of artificially high. And to show that you were a loyal member of the NRA, you would put this blue eagle on your products and the government encouraged people to only buy products that had the blue eagle on them. Next we have the TVA. It tried to help people in the Tennessee Valley um, area improve their um, quality of life and standard of living. It actually paid men to go construct dams and power plants along the Tennessee River and around the areas of the, the um, Appalachian Mountains. And it, they renovated five existing dams and they constructed over 20 new dams and this is going to create hydroelectric power for the entire region. Um, this is why my family members that lived in the um, Appalachian area, their lives actually got better during the Great Depression instead of worse because they were able to get power um, lines in their area for the first time thanks to the programs of the TVA. And here's some pictures related to the TVA we'll look at in class. And then finally we have the HOLC. This was kind of a continuation of Hoover's program called the Home Loan Bank Act. It gave low interest loans to people who faced foreclosure on their homes and it saved off a, almost a million people's homes because they were able to make their mortgage payments and um, therefore they didn't lose their homes. Okay, um, So that is the first New Deal. We'll be talking about the critics of the New Deal and also the uh, second New Deal um, next as we explore FDR's um, uh, New Deal programs and uh, look at their success and, and failures. Okay, sorry I was a little long. Thanks, bye!